Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining JNR for this exciting event. Um, one of the, you know, it's great to sort of get together <clears throat> in a digital or virtual forum. My name is Jonathan Stern. I head marketing communications at Meridian Capital Group here in New York. I'm a member of the JNF's Herzl Society and the real estate cabinet with JNF. I hope everyone's doing well, staying safe, and doing their best to adapt positively to the new normal. Um, in a world that faces tremendous uncertainty, it's important to focus on bright spots that's both you know, locally and, and nationally in commercial real estate, as well as the work that JNF is doing to transform the North and South uh, in the land of Israel. You will have an opportunity today to support the people and the land of Israel. Um, I'm honored to introduce uh, this morning's esteemed panelists. They are entrepreneurs, they're innovators, uh, opportunistic real estate investors, uh, really great people to hear from in, in this time. Uh, Mariel Ebrahimi, founder of Disrupt CRE, will moderate a conversation between Toby Moskowitz, founder and CEO of Heritage Equity Partners, and Michael Davidson, who heads global corporate real estate for JP Morgan Chase. Uh, the event is off the record and questions or will be pre or were pre-submitted by uh, registrants. Uh, before we begin the event, we'll quickly hear from Jeffrey Schwartz, uh, the chair of JNF's Housing Development Fund. Uh, he'll speak about a very relevant topic, housing in Israel. So thanks everybody for joining. And they turned it over to me. Okay, so I am carefully scripted. I have two to three minutes. I timed myself. I just blew 15 seconds. Good morning, I'm Jeff Schwartz owner and president of JS Homes. I'm a member of the Jewish National Fund Board of Directors, and I am the chair of the JNF Housing Development Fund, which I'm really excited to share more about with you. Jewish National Fund's Blueprint Negev and Go North Initiative builds quality of life infrastructure in Israel's north and south, so Israelis have better living options outside of the expensive and overcrowded center of the country something that this group most definitely understands. However, unlike the United States, there are no private residential development in Israel. All development is controlled by the municipalities. Only after all the lots in a development are purchased and financed can that physical infrastructure be developed, causing delays of up to five years in starting the housing project. As a result, JNF created a housing development fund in 2014, which provides finance, financing for communities in the Negev and Galilee, Galilee who wish to expand but lack the capital to do so. JNF provides loans, not grants, but loans which are repaid to communities and provides them the capital necessary for ground infrastructure to be completed. The theory basically is once people see work being done, more people would jump on board. Since 2014, Jewish National Fund donors, like myself, have contributed more than $10 million to the housing fund, allowing us to support the development of more than 1,200 housing sites in 26 communities. Do I get a map now, Sarah? There we go. Um, okay, so here's the cool thing, and I'm all script again, but for a second, we're not trying to drive where we build. Israel drives where they want us to build. So as you can see, we're all over the country, particularly on the borders, to support and reinforce our borders. The Housing Development Fund allows JNF donors to take their philanthropy from check writing to a new level of partnership. It's an incredible group of people, many in real estate, who are transforming the landscape in Israel. I will share my contact information if you have any questions, and I thank you very much. Back to you. All right, everyone, good morning. I'll take it away. So my name is Marielle Ibrahimi. I run a company called Disrupt CRE, all about <laughs> technology and emerging trends for commercial real estate. Um, I'm really excited for this panel. I think uh, in our most difficult times, um, a lot of positivity and uh, good things can come. I think it's an opportunity for people to be creative and kind of reimagine uh, this world that we're living in from, from so many ways. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be joined by Michael and Toby. I'm going to start off with Toby and just ask you, Toby, you're coming from a, a development perspective. Um, what are your priorities right now? <coughs> So, you know, you know, things obviously, um, you know, we, the country, um, 
had a complete stop um, in all business uh, over the last couple of months. Uh, we've had, you know, further setbacks over the last couple of days. You know, I think um, as a business and, and as, a, as a development company, we're, we're starting by reassessing the financial markets. Um, you know, certainly there's a lot of crunch on liquidity with cash flowing properties. Um, you know, a lot of the, the banks are pulling back. You know, Fannie Mae, I don't, I'm not an expert. Maybe Michael can weigh in if this is the first time in history is asking for things like interest reserves on cash loan properties because of payment uncertainty. Um, you know, for the last two months, we sort of all held our breath or kept breathing wherever we were sheltering in place. You know, we try to stay positive. We try to, try to keep busy. And I think now um, you're feeling an opening up um, of individual, you know, people becoming more accessible um, and everybody's starting to think about the next phase. You know, how is the capital going to start to flow? You know, once the initial, we'll call it periods of banks working with lenders and other funds working, I'm um, working with borrowers, that starts to wear off when the initial hysteria starts to subside. What does the new normal look like, both for cash flowing real estate? Um, in all the various asset classes, hotels, of course, got hit really badly. Retail was sucker punched after a very, uh, you know, struggling couple of years. And then what, what the implications are for development, you know, when there's a cash crunch on cash flowing real estate, you know, how that, that money continues to flow and where does it come from? Michael, um, talk, to about, talk to us about the office real estate market. What is the state of the market and, you know, can we, what can we maybe start expecting in the near term and maybe in the long term future? Yeah, Mario, thank you. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, so a couple of interesting things happened. So companies all over the world for decades invested billions and billions and billions of dollars in their workplaces, and they were very proud of them. They were proud about how they operated. They were proud about uh, the amenities they provided, the densities they were able to achieve, and then Virtually overnight, between February and March, those workplaces went vacant. Um, retail went vacant. Um, and I think it was the first time, probably in, at least in our history, that we saw that kind of rush away from the workplace. Um, and for good reason. What we have seen since is theory upon theory on will the workplace change forever? Will people ever come back to work? Will companies need as much space going forward to run their businesses? Will right. retail recover? You know, um, every single person has an opinion. What we think and what we subscribe to is, is a longer term approach, like a, a larger view on this thing. This is not the first crisis in human history. Um, and if you look and study past crises, similar things have happened. People think this is gonna be the end of this and the end of that. Um, but I think what we should be looking forward to is a recovery, a recovery not only of body, but of spirit, of the human spirit. And I think certainly when it comes to our people across the world and across the real estate industry, people are eager and optimistic on moving forward, on coming back together. If you think of what's happened economically uh, and from a real estate perspective as a coiled spring, that spring is coiling tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter with all of the things that have now come up over the past couple of weeks um, across society, it's getting even tighter. And I think that over time, as vaccines are conceived and as people reconcile, um, I think there'll be a rebound. I think there'll be a recovery. I think optimism um, and people coming together will once again be in fashion. And I think people need that. So I think I'm very optimistic about it, but I don't, but I think it also requires patience. I think that the, the crisis hit overnight, but the recovery is not going to be overnight. I think the recovery in all of these aspects is going to be a slow and steady progression over the coming months and likely years to some extent. 
So Michael, you bring a really interesting perspective because you have this kind of uh, <clears throat> view from a from a global from a global perspective. So you you kind of have some context historically to say you know there are these crises that have happened um, in different parts of our portfolio around the world, and we've seen how we've been able to recover. So taking parts and pieces from what's been effective in the past and kind of using that to to move forward in in today's kind of um, moment of uncertainty is is really powerful. Um, can you talk to us about the actual workplace and, and you're responsible for a lot of the re-entry strategy and coming back into uh, the physical space. I have heard like many others, um, you know, some will need more space, uh, we'll need less space, not everyone will come back to work. We need to make capital investments into reconfiguring the actual space. Hmm. So can you talk to us about, are you guys making any capital investments in the actual redesign of the space? Um, are there low hanging fruit uh, aspects uh, of the workplace that you're approaching first? Can you talk to us a little bit about kind of the strategy and, and tangibly what it looks like? Sure. Um, first of all, we're not making any major capital investments that are driven by the crisis or response to it. Um, what we are doing and what we have done since this, uh, since this descended upon us is that we prioritize the things that we really should be spending money on and the things we'll call them quality of life capital investments that we just simply didn't need to spend the capital here and now. But strategically, we're deploying capital in markets that make sense, crisis or not, to us as a firm. Um, the thing that we are spending a great deal of money and attention on is the hygiene in our workplace. Not changing the structure of our workplace, but making darn sure it's clean and disinfected. And that people have the right hygiene and behaviors themselves. What we found was that um, people's behaviors in the workplace weren't always um, the best. People's desks <laughs> were cluttered, very hard to clean. Uh, people assume that when they touch this keypad or that microwave or that vending machine, someone else is gonna clean that. We're encouraging a much more proactive um, approach whereby everyone has to participate in keeping the workplace clean, disinfected, and in good order. And so it's a combination of what we're doing as a firm to invest in the services we provide, but also, you know, think of it as like a code of conduct from a hygiene perspective. There are certain things that people need to do when they're in the office safe. Um, and that's our approach going forward, at least for the foreseeable future to get our people back safely and slowly. And I think culturally, when you're participating in a workplace or any sort of public space, it's kind of this opportunity to reimagine the part that we play as individuals. You go from this very individualistic experience, now kind of re-entering into whether it's the workplace, whether it's going back to school, whether it, whatever kind of in built environment it is, retail, where we're approaching the space and, and the responsibility we have by being in that space is more of a community. Um, and something, Michael, that you had said in our prep call was kind of this uh, more selflessness, less selfishness. And I think it's, it's a really cool opportunity culturally to reimagine uh, the part that we all play as individuals um, to not only just in our built environment, but it really speaks to um, just our communities at large as people now that we really can value what it means to be together um, in such an extreme way. I and so I think, I think just moving on with that kind of concept of reimagination and, and also um, kind of redefining the value proposition of what these places this these built environments are serving uh back to us as people what you know what is, what are they bringing to us because if we're going to come now back into a physical space they better be bringing value that we can't get by you know working from home or shopping online or whatever it happens to be that we've adjusted in our behavior <laughs> so, so toby i want to kick it to you and and talk maybe about some other asset classes um you know, how do you think that some of these other asset classes are going to be able to kind of redefine the value proposition? Um, what opportunities are you seeing? Yeah, you know, so I, I think that, you know, when we chatted about this, you know, on the prep call as well, you know, across the board, whether it's deploying technologies like, you know, old buildings, putting in elevator management systems, um, where you need to go ahead and schedule through, through an app, uh, a time, the exact time when you're going to ride the elevator to, to manage capacity. I think you know, across the board, we're looking at 
a rapid escalation in deployment of new solutions. Um, you know, I, I, I forget who, who said this, you know, never waste a good emergency, um, you know, across the board. You know, you, you talk about retail, you know, retail was, was struggling because, you know, why does someone go in a store when you could just ship things back and forth? You know, when I go to the UPS store here, I'm staying in, in Boca Raton, Florida, that's the only store with a line around the corner. You know, they let in two people at a time. So, you know, why would somebody walk into a retail store? You know, we've seen that we'll pull up the appleization of, of all, all kinds of stores. You know, I, I'm based in Williamsburg. In Williamsburg, you have local retailers. Gantt was there for a while with a liquor license. Um, you know, the local urban outfitters opened up a consignment vintage clothing store. So it was a whole retail ex experience. So I think for, for companies to, to continue to, to be successful, especially in light of the current financial pressure um, being caused by this complete shutdown, you know, every single asset class is going to, to have to innovate. But, but I'm going to, you know, go back for a second to some of Michael's comments on office. So I was having a chat yesterday with one of my tenants um, in the tech industry. And I think it's interesting to look at the reaction of various companies like, you know, financial services, you know, versus some of the more, um, you know, tech oriented entrepreneurial companies. And what they were telling me was they don't, they basically see a fall off in, in productivity. Um, that they're a company in the innovation space, the, the management ownership, um, you know, believes deeply in physical space, that they're, you know, call it random interactions, and you simply can't innovate at that level when you're not in the same physical space. And what they're up against is their employees are saying, look, Facebook, Twitter, Google, everybody's announcing, you know, you never have to come back, you can come back in 2024, you know, and, and they have to deal with employees saying, well, the whole, the whole world is going virtual. Let's just keep working virtually. Um, and, you know, I, I heard, I don't, I don't know if it was Michael, someone mentioned this sort of looking at the continuum of efficiency versus effectiveness. You know, how much work have we actually done? It's great that we're still effective or still efficient. Are we really being as effective? And a terrible example of that, of course, famously is Yahoo. And they had this, you know, very early in this policy of, letting people work from home as often as they want and look what happened to the company. So, you know, it's amazing and we're all delighted with the life work balance, but there's a real practical challenge to being able to run a business and being able to create a, a effective outcomes and in, and in innovative outcomes when you're not randomly bumping into people. It's like the opposite. We're like trying to spew do dogma that's the opposite of everything we've learned in the last in the last five years about what it means to run a great company. So, uh, Michael, I see you smiling. We'd love to hear you. <laughs> as, as you can tell, I'm very, you know, I'm the woman who I don't even have a real office. I, I work sort of out of my car. I, I work at a conference rooms. Everybody in my company has an office. And I, I am deeply committed to the idea that you can't, we cannot be successful as a country until we figure out how to work in physical space again. And, and anyone who says otherwise is just ignoring the, everything that's happened in the last five years with innovation at every level, both in you know, larger, more established companies and in the tech industry. I'm done, Mike. Well, I'm done like with you're my agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, to, to, to Toby, I, um, I love listening to you speak because you're, you're spot on. Um, something I said to our folks at, the, at our company uh, over the past few weeks, I said, don't mistake something. Everyone's been super productive because no one has anything better to do. You can't do anything else but work. Uh, work is one of the only things that you're able to do. But when society opens and people have options again, the movies open, theaters open, restaurants open, wine bars open, uh, soccer practice has to be held again. Uh, when life uh, reblossoms, uh, you have to watch that because people are animals. We need structure. And so I don't know that this productivity that we've seen over the last three months is sustainable once people have other things to do. Very interesting. Do you guys see the strategy around office and location changing um, because of kind of this new world? Obviously, people are, you know, some have decided to leave the city. Um, some are working in kind of a new environment. Uh, we've all been creative with what's effective for our day to day, um, depending on what your home situation is. But, you know, we have we have seen more of an uptick in conversation for a distributed office model, um, kind of working where it makes sense for your life. Um, can, can, can you speak to that at all? 
I, I can. Um, so where we are doing business, the location strategy that we've developed is not going to change. Um, you know, it's been thoughtfully crafted over the past 10 years. And I will say that, um, you know, we have a responsibility to stay in the communities that we're in. The last thing communities uh, across the United States and the world need is for big companies to exit. And so we, we need to double down. We need to be re recommitted to the communities that we serve so that we're there for people. Uh, recommitted um, to make sure that as other businesses recover, we recover with them and help them do it. So I think our, our thinking is the, is the opposite in that way in that we're there for the long term for the communities and the people that we serve. And, and, and well, we should be, frankly. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, I echo what Michael said, you know, I, I was you know, one of the first developers to build spec office in Brooklyn. Um, I have a second project we're working on now um, in Bushwick out, out of Williamsburg. And I think it, it's actually, I think you'll see it playing out differently now that we, we've all woken up to the need for some balance. Um, people want that ultimate amenity, which is to work close to home. Um, it's anti this, the urban movement is over. Um, you know, we view neighborhoods as amenities, being part of the community as an amenity. You know, they're in Brooklyn, for example, 50, over 50% 50 of startup tech companies are founded by women. And, you know, what is the ultimate job perk? It's to be able to be close to your home. Um, and that's a lot of what's been driving the growth of Dumbo, uh, the growth, in, the growth in industry city, and other um, you know companies that are planting themselves you know out of Manhattan. But at the same time, I think the the idea of you know what it means to live in an urban environment. So I I don't believe we're going to see a return to the suburban model. Um, you know we need to figure out how to safely interact with people. Um, I do think that you will see growth personally in the the shared workspace uh, world. You know if you come to Williamsburg, for example, there's a Coffee it used to be called Toby's Estate. I didn't own it. It was an Australian company. Now it's called Partners Coffee. You know, that's where people hang. You know, it's like the main workspace. But are you going to be willing to go spend hours sitting in a coffee shop for the next couple months? You probably feel safer going into a shared workspace, you know, where there's some social interaction, but there's somebody who's cleaning and there is a modicum of, right. of sort of control. So I think it's going to be interesting to watch things play out, maybe contrary to what's, what seems obvious. Um, everyone's chafing at the bit, wanting to get out, get back to normal life. Um, we're going to get back to normal. I remember those days when I used to see tourists from certain parts of the world, you know, Asia, for example, walking around Manhattan with masks, and we would laugh at them like, they're neurotic. What's going on? You know, we're all going to have to, you know, somebody posted last week, his daughter's a nurse, and she's developed some lung disease because she's breathing her own carbon dioxide. So, you know, putting aside the medical issues and figuring out what what's a safe environment looks like i think you know we're going to need to reconfigure what it means to have work-life balance because our employees expectations are changing um, we're going to need to need to reconfigure what it means for an office to be and a schedule you can't just come up show up to your building and hop on the elevator right you know your lunch is at a certain time you know if, you know the companies like google you know i've been in their amazing building in the meatpacking district you know free food all over the place a huge like we said, pots of food sitting there, you know, could, could we offer company amenities in the same way that we have in the past? Um, so all of that, I think, is going to be, have to be reconfigured, um, you know, starting with introducing the concept that work from home is not as effective as working from an office and making sure that, you know, we get our great employees uh, to come back. I think it's a very, you said something very interesting. Uh, one thing that you said was very interesting about kind of, as people are thinking about different <laughs> places that they could work, like a coffee shop or, you know, getting creative with a, some sort of distributed office model. I think what people forget is that as real, the real estate industry, uh, property management, facility management, cleaning, these are things that we, you know, we uh, have been offering, have been doing. Um, we don't have to first kind of set up that infrastructure uh, with uh, getting creative to work from somewhere else. These are kind of the nuts and bolts of what make a functional uh, building or workplace safe um, generally. And if we can double down on bringing those services in an even more efficient and effective way, um, why would we look to, to be you know, working in, in, in other places? Do you, do you guys see uh, the approach to real estate strategy changing um, in other aspects? Could be investing, leasing, design, 
Um, Toby, you had, we had talked a little bit about kind of just the hotel market, you know, and, and kind of how it's changing so much and uh, potentially, you know, might change the strategy sure. moving forward. So, you know, so, so I'll comment on hotels. Um, I think it's, it's a, you know, an industry that's really gotten hit very, very hard. Um, you know, on the one hand, you have really small mom and pop owners all over the country, you know, Holiday Inn Express is, uh, you know, three, three star hotels. Um, I know that the, the large brands have been working with them to try to mitigate the ongoing costs, but you know, people just are not traveling. Um, so really been hard hit. Um, and, you know, that's <clears throat> coming off a wave where in certain parts of the industry, they were, they were challenged with regard to sort of the Airbnb model. And I think we're going to see things playing out in quite an interesting way. You know, Airbnb was stepping up their game. I got calls at the Williamsburg Hotel. We have a water tower. They have something called Airbnb experiences. They're you know, trying to give people a reason to look out of the traditional hospitality arena. But think about this. Are you, would you feel more comfortable staying in someone's home, private home, or going to a Marriott? Um, I think we're going to see, you know, things playing out in a very unexpected way where, you know, standardization um, is really important. You know, my general manager sent me videos of, um, you know, Las Vegas, some of the hotels put out very detailed videos explaining their cleaning protocol, explaining how they're handling chips on a table, trying to get people to come back. So, you know, I think some of the new innovations in the hospitality industry are simply going to fall by the wayside because people won't feel safe you know, going and being in someone's, in someone's private home, whether they're, they're there or not. Um, and I think, you know, as an industry, you know, we need to get people moving again. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a big part of our business has been corporate travel and corporate events. Um, you know, when are people going to meet up again in big groups now that the virtual conference, you know, has become a thing? Um, so I, I think there's a t tremendous amount of uncertainty in the industry, both with regard to you know, on the innovation side, how these companies are going to continue to survive and thrive when people are going to become more traditional in the choices that they make. Um, and then the need for conferences and big gatherings to come back to really support demand in the industry. Um, and the last piece, of course, is tourism. Um, and, you know, really bad piece of, a piece of bad news for New York was Disney announcing that Frozen you know, was not going to come back. Um, you know, Broadway is a huge draw. So you know, this is a multi-billion dollar company with a significant balance sheet making a decision about a show that, you know, we would have, one would have thought there was enough demand, but obviously they have Lion King and others. So those are the three elements here that are required for the hospitality industry to, to bounce back. And there's certainly a lot, a lot of uncertainty around that issue. As much as, you know, I love conferences. I think, you know, I've raised a lot of money over the years from people I randomly bumped into at a conference who I never would have met. Um, in the normal course, uh, you know, of business. And, and I think, you know, we need to figure out how to do that. You know, when's the next time you're going to stick your hand out to shake hands with a stranger? You know, you do the fist bump. It's like that meme someone's been pointing out, sending around it with a cake, a birthday cake. They said, could you imagine that a few months ago, somebody blew on this and then we all took pieces of cake and ate it, right? <laughs> um, that's so that's so true. Please make sure that JP Morgan allows conference gatherings again. We need those people to come uh, participate. <laughs> I, hear you loud and clear. Um, I think this is a this is a, a good moment to talk about uh, technology and innovation because I think what we've we've seen happen over the last three months is a lot of the nice to have creative initiatives that were underway um, all of a sudden a lot of those came to the top of the of the list as a priority and all of a sudden it's more important than ever that we are um, not only just being creative for the sake of how are we bringing people back and what is it going to look like in this new world but just reaching a level of efficiency in an industry that traditionally has been really slow to uh, prioritize could be energy savings um, air quality could be uh, even just tenant engagement. And I think tenant engagement is a very, very interesting aspect of the tech stack where it was a nice to have for the last few years if you prioritized it. And all of a sudden, as people are working from home, those you know buildings that do have some sort of centralized communication um, through technology have really been able to um, 
continue to offer services, continue to offer events, engage with their tenants at home in a way that's uh, elevated um, and meaningful. And so that's, that's one example of a million different initiatives that are all of a sudden um, a priority. Can you guys, either one of you speak to, has it become a priority within your organization? How are you thinking about it? Um, Take it on. You know, there's the, the old saying, necessity is the mother of invention. So I think that for landlords and developers and large companies, investments in technologies that are touchless, that are more efficient, that facilitate the operations of buildings that may have been, let's say, um, secondary in the past, have gained priority in the, in the present. And I think that this crisis has forged a great deal of investment in terms of how to operate our buildings differently not entirely differently, but in, in far more efficient ways from our, uh, Toby talked about the infrastructure to um, card access, uh, uh, biometrics. All of these things are very compelling when you think of the millions of people that come in and out of our buildings every day for events. Um, far less manual. I think that going forward, things that may have, you know, seems a bit arcane, uh, will no longer be. I think there'll be a lot of touchless, um, data-driven technologies across our buildings that will go from the user, from the front door, right up to where they sit, um, even into the HVAC. I think there's a lot of investment happening right now in that space. And I, I think, you know, just to add to Michael's point, you know, there are certainly a lot of Israeli tech companies um, in the building services, building management, both, you know, both in the physical infrastructure side and then, um, you know, in whether it's the platforms for, for tenant management, et cetera. I think there's a moment in time where everything's going to be reassessed. Uh, the real estate industry has been notoriously hard to sell new solutions into. Um, and now you have no choice. You know, you, if you have an old elevator bank, um, it's just not going to be capable of handling scheduled uh, arrivals. So you, you have no choice. You're talking, you're speaking today with companies and reassessing how your elevators work. So I think that on, on the positive side, there are going to be billions of dollars invested in retrofitting old buildings. A process that might have taken a decade is going to happen now in a year or two because people simply have no choice. I think on the energy management side, you're going to see shifting. Um, you know, companies that don't want to take more space, people will start working odder hours. And, and that requires things like energy management systems. So there's going to be a very concentrated moment in time where buildings are retrofit because, you know, an, an owner that has a building they own for 20, 30 years, unless there's a gun to their heads, they just don't want to change. And now there, there is that gun, uh, gun to their heads. And I think on the residential side as well, like if you look at some of the new buildings, you know, we put, for example, shared workspace, people, when we were on the first owners in Brooklyn to do that in residential buildings, people laughed at us. They said, oh, it's a gimmick. I mean, think right. about it. Everybody was stuck at home now. Um, and if you didn't have a public space or something like that, when you're living in efficient apartments in a city, you know, it's, so this is like, now that's all it is. Everything from how in residential buildings, how boxes are processed when they come in. A lot of, a lot of buildings didn't build the right kinds of, of, of spaces and systems for tenants to get those packages coming in and out. When the volume went up by tenfold, you just were forced to figure, to figure it out. So I think there's going to be a lot of capital investment. You know, once to Michael's point, we really understand the implications of human behavior and what needs to happen for the world to go back to normal. And, and it put us in a much healthier, stronger place, you know, ultimately, um, with regard to how real estate and its various asset classes are developed and utilized. I think it's it's very interesting and we have seen billions of dollars in the last just even three months pouring into real estate tech, which I know that I wasn't sure that that would happen. I actually wasn't sure that this would become the priority that it has become. Um, you know, a lot of it just makes sense uh, for, for the work that we need to do now from home. And it is, I think, very interesting on the multifamily side. Um, all of a sudden, you really require this almost commercial bandwidth. Uh, you have, you know, maybe yeah. you know, parents working from home, kids working from home, you have multiple devices. Um, it's really become this almost, you know, center for business. And we're, we're relying on, and here we are all, you know, in this virtual event, uh, relying on our at-home networks um, and we're kind of 
beholden to it. Um, so I think we will need different things, but I think there is a, a big difference between what makes sense for the short term and what's going to make sense ultimately for the long term. And that's what I hear you, Michael, saying is in the long term, uh, we're going to need very similar to what we've had and what we've carefully and thoughtfully designed uh, as our working infrastructure for the last 10 years. And in the interim, we can take steps to ultimately be smarter, not just for today, but ultimately for that long term goal. Um, and so I, I definitely want to talk a little bit about about the future and what you guys see uh, just as some some overarching opportunities when we discussed this panel and kind of the overarching themes. Uh, Michael, I think it was you who really talked about kind of Jewish values and something that has and will continue to remain constant uh, in all of our lives is the values that we share, um, you know, in, in all kinds of different circumstances. And I think it's an important message. Do, do you want to comment on that? Sure. Absolutely. I think, um, look, it's, it's apropos to this conversation, uh, most certainly today, uh, but Jewish values are human values. And, and, it, and if you look at the crisis from a biological perspective, um, from a protection perspective, from a social distance perspective, and if you look at most problems that humanity faces, um, the fail-safe way to get out of those crises usually has something to do with values, is how we relate to one another, is how we respect one another, is how we honor each other, uh, each other's beliefs. Uh, and I think, look, uh, just watch the news. <laughs> Uh, you know, a good dose of values, um, even when it comes to business and innovation, um, empathy. Empathy is one of the seeds of innovation, because if people aren't listening to one another and considering other points of view, uh, not just their own, innovation can't happen. Um, so I think the Jewish values or human values in that they are actually the path um, from a business perspective, from a health perspective, and even just how we relate to one another in our workplace perspective. It all has to do with selflessness and how we think and honor each other. And, you know, I think I would add, you know, we were all living in a frenzied world where our personal lives and our business lives were running in parallel. Um, you know, and I, and I know as, as a single mom, like I, I would always announce, I have to leave early because I'm going to a baseball game or I have a doctor's appointment or I, I think that there's the, the the human the fact that we're all human beings um, we have families we have children their health issues and that also has to matter I think that's become an, a much deeper part of the public discourse that's led to the other challenges we're trying to grapple with as a country um, and I think both with regard to our co-workers tolerating and understanding the individual challenges that people around them have faced you know, our, our bosses, our employees, our companies, um, you know, you see what happened when there was a backlash with the PPP loans, where Shake Shack stood up and said, I, you know, I'm giving the money back. And, you know, I, I eat kosher, so I've never eaten there. But my feeling towards that company was, you know, they, they sort of took a, a positive moral stance. Um, mm -hmm. And I think as a country, we're, we're becoming more, you know, we, we fit our expectation of what good corporate behavior, what good human behavior is, it's now a public discourse in a way in which, you know, everything was about money, everything was about profit, everything was about productivity. Um, and now we're allowed to be humans. We have to have more empathy. You know, you know, we, I, I have a building that's right near the projects in Bushwick. You know, we were running uh, almost like a, a free shared workspace. We had a partnership in place with Google. And, you know, we got, we got approached. We were fortunate the World Central Kitchen came in. We've given out a couple hundred thousand meals. Um, and I've seen and I've, I've come to understand and appreciate the challenges that people are dealing with when they can't put food on the table. And, they're, and, and then looking at the good coming from upstate New York farmers who are literally giving away food so that it's not just here's a free cooked meal, but here are the ingredients so you could be with your family, you could nurture your children, you could cook them food, you know, whatever culture you come from, whatever kind of food you're going to cook. So I think the expectation we have of ourselves the expectation we have of our country and the expectation we have of our communities has gone up and the challenge is going to be to continue to sustain that when, as Michael point at, points out, offices open up, the, the movie theaters are back, restaurants are open, to maintain that level of consciousness, which, you know, is human values, it is Jewish values, um, you know, and it's really all about, you know, what is it said when, when you know, 
talk about learning the Torah on one foot. It says, love your fellow man like yourself. Um, and that's the ultimate of empathy, of recognizing and appreciating the challenges other people you know, are going through um, and trying to do your best in spite of, of the situation. I think this moment has really opened up a lot of opportunity for us to connect to one another as just humans, even if it is in a business relationship. And that's such a beautiful, um, special thing. I mean, we're all having such a unique, specific experience in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, certainly, you know, it's changed and we've become maybe a little bit more comfortable. Um, but I think that it also, uh, it also speaks to a lot of things, exciting things to come down the road and, and a lot of opportunities. I think um, humans, when we're left with a moment of maybe even more quiet than we usually have because we're not commuting, because we're not going to events, because we can spend more time with our families, um, it strips away a lot of the barrier uh, that we have in our normal lives to be creative, right? It's, it's usually you go to work, you're, you're in it, uh, you're doing the tasks, you're responsible to others, but now in, in this kind of shift of energy, we're responsible to ourselves, to our families, to our immediate teams that we're working with, but it gives us space in our, in our brains, um, in, our, in our day to day to be creative. Um, and I, I do see a lot of resiliency in the people around me. Um, and so it gives me a lot of hope and excitement for what's to come because I think uh, a lot of what's to come is still unknown which could be scary, but I, for me, it's really exciting. I know Michael and, and Toby, you probably share in that excitement. Um, I think a lot of good is to come. So I wanna talk about some of the opportunities, but before we jump in, I think something that's kind of, we're, we're talking about, you guys have both mentioned before this panel is that until we know how humans will behave coming back into the world, it's very difficult to make plans, make capital investment in a redesign, for example, or the number of other things that all of us will look to you guys as leaders uh, to think that you may be doing. But just as human beings, as society, we're not sure how people will act. And that's a big part. That's a big kind of missing link. And there's no way of knowing what that will be like. And so, uh, Michael, before we kind of talk about generally what opportunities may lie, will you comment on, on your perspective? Sure. I think... Um... People, one thing is not going to change. People need people. And that genealogically, since like we stood up straight, people need people. No matter what challenges we face, no matter what pandemics we face, no matter what wars we fight, um, people always come back to the center and they come back to each other because that's, that's how we're wired. That's our, like, that's our uh, operating system is being together. We're social animals first and foremost. So even though we're pushed apart, even though we have to be distant, even though all these things happen, the, the, the magic of humanity happens in person. The magic of relationships, of business, of love, of feeling trust, all of those things happen when people connect in person. Um, and I think that's important to remember because the workplace is one of the key venues. It's like the Met for a lot of these engagements. Um, just as, as Toby said, uh, hotels, uh, other venues, theaters, the enjoyment of the arts, et cetera, they're all manifestations of that magic. Look, I'm a marathon runner. I'm hoping the New York Marathon is run this year, uh, symbolically. Uh, and also for New York City, it's the single biggest economic event of the year that not all people know. So as, as these events are canceled, it means a lot economically to these places. Now, if, I, if they do hold the marathon, I'm hoping that Toby waves to me while I'm going through Brooklyn. You know, Absolutely. I'm going to hold you to it, Toby. Um, we'll throw you a bottle of water. Uh, I'll take it. So we're going to come back together. And I think that how that happens, who knows? There's a mystery to that. How long is it going to take socially, um, professionally? Let that unfold naturally so that it's safe. But yeah, I, I think humanity is going to come right back to the center um, and it will be a new improved center where, what, where we probably don't take it, each other for granted as much. We cherish that connection even more than we ever did. And I think we honor each other in, in ways that certainly for Western civilization, because we've not gone through this before, not, not like this in this generation. Um, I think there'll be a renewed respect for one another. 
um, going forward. Um, what kind of opportunities do you guys see out there coming, coming our way? What, are, what gets you excited for the future? So, you know, you know I, I think, you know, to Michael's point, you know, if you look at the intersection between humanity and human behavior, um, and then the realities of, of dealing with, you know, changes in, in, you know, right now a lot, you know, a lot of it's, you know, lenders, investors, uh, financial markets trying to understand, you know, what's going on and where things are going. Um, I, I think, you know, I've been accused of being a venture capitalist in the real estate market. You know, because the doors weren't open to me, I developed in areas no one was interested in and asset classes no one was interested in. Um, and that led me to be a pioneer. Um, you know, necessities, mother invention. I think we're going to see that level of invention um, come in across the board. Um, you know, there was a there was a great post I saw yesterday on LinkedIn of, of, of really a venture capitalist quoted what's been the old adage and said, you know, get a warm introduction and come through my door. And he said, I know that there are populations that aren't in my network. You know, go ahead and this is my email address. This is my cell phone number. You know, even if you don't know a lawyer on Sand Hill Road and you can't network your way, call me. And that's the result of a change tone in this country about access, about accessibility, about opportunity. You know, I'm on the National Advisory Board of Springboard Enterprises. You know, the flow of capital to women in, in the tech industry has been like single digits forever. It hasn't gone up. You know, forget about real estate. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> so I, I think the idea that economic prosperity, you know, we everybody can work hard, but for certain population, doors are not open, um, and there is a need to think through that. There's a need to take responsibility. You know, there's this whole ESG movement, but companies have to think about. You know, it starts with hiring. It it, it also flows into the flow of capital uh, across the board in, in all asset classes and all and all industries. Um, and I think so. I'm very optimistic about the moment we're in right now. I think sometimes change is painful. You know, there are people in the streets that are rioting, that looting, that's not acceptable. Um, the fact that there's a voice of protest in this country that's standing up and saying, you know, everybody deserves to have a good life. Everybody deserves to have access. I think we're healing together as a nation. It was forced upon us. Um, and I, I am very optimistic about where that goes. There are amazing companies that are started when all doors shut down. You know, I started my company in the end of 2008. I, I wanted to be in the direct wow. investing business and I ended up in the real estate business. And sometimes when things don't go as planned, it allows us to build muscle. And I think we're gonna do that as individuals. I think we're gonna do that as a nation. Um, and there's still only one United States of America with the level of innovation, the level of economic mobility that we have. So I'm very optimistic to see, see where we as a country go in the next months and the next years as we really unleash this healing and this growth um, as a nation, and then at every local level in our communities. And I think we saw a lot come out of, you know, this last economic downturn. Some of the biggest, you know, kind of disruptors of industries across the board have come out of uh, downturns. And I think in this moment, we have so many people who are, um, you know, unfortunately have lost their jobs or are changing their focus, you know, repositioning their energy. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of talent out there for, for tackling some of these problems. And, and like I mentioned before, a lot of freedom that's all of a sudden been discovered to be creative, um, where maybe people haven't even had that opportunity in the past. So I'm incredibly optimistic as well. Um, I've seen the resiliency in, in people and, and entrepreneurship, even in, in, in the best of times. Um, um, it's really profound in the last few years, especially. So um, that's my takeaway. Sarah, are we, are we, are there any, oh, actually we do have another question specifically from Michael, I believe from, um, from the group. Um, and that is, or, or let me see. I think the last question we wanted to ask is, where is humanity going post pandemic and what will humans do? We've, we've talked about this um, quite a bit, but Michael, I think from a, a global perspective, um, is there anything you can lend that maybe folks would not either expect from humans or have not seen that you've seen um, in other places? Well, I, you know, with all this unemployment, the, um, the predominant energy around all of it is the sorrow for people that lost jobs. 
tens of millions of people. But if you turn that and pivot and you think about all those people have been thinking deeply about what they want in their lives, um, whether the job that they had was the job that they should have, do they have talents, do they have skills that they want to gain? I think it, it could be very exciting when you have that many people coming back into the workforce, maybe not in the spot that they left it. Uh, and so I think that it, it, there's going to be a lot of micro movement across society as people find their new spots in terms of employment, in terms of talent and what they bring to bear. I think from a, from a company perspective, a services perspective, a goods perspective, I mean, there's, I, I think there's going to be a lot of movement there as well. There's a lot of opportunities for companies maybe that, that can't survive on their own, so they get together and create something new or conceive of something different, a new service model, a new product, a new way of doing what they do together. So I, I think it's very exciting. I think all of this is going to be sort of like reading a novel um, as, we, as we live into this and lean into this. And you know, you only have, fear is what we have to fear. The worst thing is that we let our sorrow dominate our psyche. We have to, I mean, we're, this is nice because we're all optimists having this beautiful conversation, but <laughs> I think society wants to lean in and be optimistic. And I think we're at our best when we're optimistic. Um, and when we come out of the valley of sorrow, which is what the world has been in, um, I think there'll be a bounce back there too, psychologically and emotionally, that will fuel innovations and partnerships and collaborations and mergers and all sorts of stuff that we can't predict today that will, that will bring good surprises to us going forward. And, you know, I, I would add to that point that, you know, the story of the startup nation in Israel is, is a good story that really gives us guidance and light. Um, and, you know, if you, look, if you think about what happened in the 70s when, you know, where did this all begin? We had no natural resources. We just had human resource. Um, and then you had this whole crew of Russian engineers who came into this country and seeded this movement with Intel. And, and all the major tech companies coming there to access this talent that came to Israel. And then the various phases. I worked in, in Israel in the venture industry in between uh, 90, 99 and 2001. That was sort of phase one, looking at phase two now, you know, with this booming economy and constant innovation and constant growth and massive human capital, which is flowing into New York. We have 500 Israeli companies. I think that, you know, to Michael's point, you know, people always say, what would you do if you had nothing to lose? And there's so many people now in this country and in the world that are in that exact spot, that are forced to find a muscle that they didn't know they had, the resilience they didn't know they had, to reinvent their lives. And I, I think that we saw post-2008 the impact. As you pointed out, Marielle, so many amazing companies were started. And I think you're going to see a huge wave of innovation. And I know the Israeli economy and the Israeli com communities and the Israeli voice of innovation across the board um, is really a good guide for us as to what a country can do when people stand up and say, we have nothing to lose. So we're going to live that life as if we have nothing to lose and build something amazing. And also, and also approaches uh, life from really a community standpoint, right? Where I think in New York, we, we have approached things from a more individualistic standpoint um, over the years and it's, it's become more and more so. So now we have this opportunity to go, to go back and, and revisit. Um, I, I would love to end the conversation on this <laughs> beautiful part, um, but I do wanna make sure that we uh, address one of the questions from the audience uh, for Michael, which is about uh, the JP Morgan uh, office occupancy, where do you envision its office occupancy uh, to be compared to where it is today, maybe five years or, you know, in, in the future? Um, I don't know is the honest answer, but I'll mm -hmm. embellish to answer, I'll, I'll provide some uh, context to it. I don't know. We don't know. But, but what, we, what we do know is that um, we want to continue to provide spaces for our people to be together and to collaborate and innovate and meet our clients and do the things we do. Um, we, we connect people and capital. Like that's the, that's the bones of our business. And so to do that, you need to have a place to do that. And it, it can't be virtual, not 100% of the time. So the spaces that we have also define culture. You know, we talk about 
Um, humanity is known for one thing. We love to build stuff and then look at it and say, look, look what we did. This represents our society. This represents what we believe in. This represents how we pray, how we work, how we love, how we think. We love to build things that we can look at and sit in and enjoy. That ain't changing. And so from, from a JP Morgan perspective, um, we will continue to lean into our workplace. Uh, we'll also be smart about it and, and acknowledge that if people need more flexibility, well, of course, we honor that. And there are lessons to be learned, but there's no hyperbole here. It's not a all or nothing proposition. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna exit forever or do this forever. No, it's all shades of gray in the middle. That's where we're working. And we're trying to find where in the spectrum of how we embrace our workforce and the communities that we serve, where is the right landing spot on that trajectory? Um, but it isn't gonna be all or nothing. I just wanna say, as long as we have leaders like Michael and Toby that are really pushing forth and paving the way for all of us in the real estate industry and just in our communities uh, in New York or wherever we happen to be, um, I feel excited and optimistic. And I hope, I hope that uh, just some of the conversation brought that to your mornings uh, today as well. So with that, I'll pass it back over um, uh, to Sarah or Tyler, whoever's, whoever's taken over. Um, but thank you guys so much for sharing. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mariel. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Mariel, Toby, and Michael. This was uh, incredibly uplifting and informative. I think everybody kind of needs some things to look forward to and some honest answers to important questions. Um, so I think we'll see a lot of innovation, hopefully, coming out of this period of history, as well as you know, a lot of the things that you touched on about human compassion and, and, and all that. So um, I hope everybody that joined us learned a lot from the panelists, uh, also, but also about the transformative work about the JNF in, in Israel. And I uh, encourage everyone to get involved um, with the real estate group or the housing fund. Join the JNF family. It's a great group of people. Um, you know, I'm honored to be part of it. The real estate division has been raising money for much needed COVID emergency funds and PPE, things like that in Israel. Um, computers for students with special needs who no longer have classroom access and are learning remotely, supporting farmers whose business have been uh, devastated by the economic impact of COVID. So it's taking an active stance in addition to, you know, through a lot of the partnership organizations that, that we work with. So everyone will be receiving an email uh, and a text about, you know, some we're giving them the ability to make a gift. I encourage you, obviously, to do so. Help make a difference. You know, every every amount uh, matters. And then um, also feel free to reach out to me directly or Sarah is easy for more information on how to get involved with the Housing Development Fund or, or the Real Estate Division. Um, most of all, you know, thank you everyone for joining. Stay safe, healthy. Have a great day and a great week.